So now I'm delighted to uh, introduce uh, Sheena Bull, who's the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Digital Education in the Department of Community and Behavioral Health of the University of Colorado, Denver. We'll talk about research, practice, and partnership, the academic perspective. I would say that um, Sheena has just been one of the great allies and friends of the LRPC, so we're just delighted to have you here, Sheena. Thank you. Muy buenos días a todos. Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? Still hanging in there? Good. Okay, so before I start, I want to um, just have a quick disclaimer. I'm hoping, actually, that everything I have to say is old information and things and just a, a refresher for everyone in this room. And I also would like to acknowledge that there's probably several people in this room who have been doing the, this kind of work longer and have a lot more expertise than, than I do. But uh, let's, let me just understand who my audience is. Can you raise your hand if you consider yourself um, an academic? Okay. And this is a little experiment. How about, the, how about if you consider yourself a Latino community member? It's interesting that all the Latino community members are in the back and all the academics are in the front. <laughs> so the Latino community members need to come up front. Um, so I'm going to be talking about community engagement specifically, and it really is a charge. So I want to just encourage everyone in this room, if you are an academic and you don't know these principles, to start to think about them and think about how you can incorporate them in your work. Um, and then if you are a community member, I'll charge you to demand this of any academic that you work with or any academic that approaches you to collaborate. So I want to introduce concepts of participatory research, or it's also called community-based participatory research or community-engaged research. Um, and hopefully, as I mentioned, these are just a refresher for the majority of the people in the room um, to think about what are best practices. And I hope it's beyond aspiration now that most of these are being put into place. We can talk about examples of each, and I would love to hear from you about how your own experiences reflect these examples. Um, and then I want to talk about resources for faculty to access and improve their efforts to create true partnerships for participatory research. So this is really what is at the core of what I want to talk about, these nine principles uh, from community-based participatory research for health. And actually, these principles have, are, are not new. They've been around for, I'm, for, well, at least over 15 years. But they've been in development and practice for longer than that. And we have colleagues in Michigan and New Mexico that have been at the forefront. But then many researchers here, including in our School of Public Health and the university, who espouse these. Um, so there are nine, and I'm going to go through them and just give some examples of how they're being played out in uh, the research opportunities that you have. So the first is the idea of recognizing the community as a unit of identity. So we still have, you know, anthropologists have made their entire career over identifying what does community mean. So what does community mean for people in this room? Why don't you shout out some examples? You have to shout loud because I'm kind of deaf. Relationships. Relationships. Language. Language. Connection. Connection. Family. Family. Support. Support. Acculturation. Acculturation. Okay, so th that's a very diverse set of ideas, right? So it's really hard for us to get our mind around what does it mean to be a community. And when you're a researcher, and you're seeking partnership to work with communities to perhaps start to address some of those health disparities Dr. Barrio talked about, you're going to have to think about, well, who is the community that I want to work with? If I want to work with people who are facing mental health issues, do I work with elderly? Do I work with people who identify as Mexican-American? Do I work with people who identify as new immigrant? Do I work with people who are young? Do I work with the LGBT community? So you have to, first of all, figure out that community is a very diverse term and can, and can encompass a lot of different ideas and concepts. The other thing to think about is that 
whoever you're working with, they have a diverse skill set and they have something to contribute to your work or can perhaps make your work substantially more improved through a partnership. So we often will think of a community as a geographic group, um, the Denver community or uh, the Latino community as defined geographically by people who live in Central Mexico, Central and South America. But there are a lot of subgroups within that. So we've worked with uh, Latina women of reproductive age. We've worked with Latina teenagers who are also part of a larger youth group who do not identify as Latino. We've, we've worked with um, Latino uh, middle and uh, elder aged groups. So it's been uh, really critical for us to get that clear from the beginning. And a related topic, of course, is the idea of utilizing and sharing community assets. So community expertise is not only invaluable, it's critical to your research success. I would support, I would suggest that part of the reason we continue to see disparities is that we haven't done a good job of partnering with communities and getting their input in from the very beginning, even before you decide what your research question is and what you're going to pursue in terms of funding support and how you're gonna design your trial. So that expertise needs to be part and parcel of every research endeavor that you undertake. So um, many of you may be familiar with Paulo Freire. He's a Brazilian educator who's a leader in the concept of co-creating knowledge, this idea that we're not empty vessels. The, the educational model where we sit in a classroom and have someone share information um, uh, that fills us up is not correct. It's really that the learning is a co-creative process. No one educates anyone else, nor do we educate ourselves. We educate one another. So we have these experiences and we share these experiences and we have to value the contributions of all of our partners. Re on a related topic is the idea of equity. So um, we're a, a critical principle here is the idea of creating equitable partnerships. And on the bottom you see, I have to turn around and figure out which is your, your orientation on the left, um, is this idea of equality. So everyone is equal. Everyone has the same size box. But as you can see, not everyone gets the same benefit from that equality. Equity is the idea that you are equitably sharing resources so that people can have the same outcome, so that people can share the same benefit. So here's just a few examples, but I'd love to hear from you in the audience. What are ways that we can do a better job of creating equitable partnerships? We can hire community members to be a part of our staff. What are some other ideas? You have to shout them. Focus groups to get input from community members, okay. Mm -hmm. So there is several ideas there. Build relationships over time. I really want to come back to that one. It's critical. Um, work with community organizations. There are a lot of people that, and a ton of resources, many of which are represented in this room, of community organizations that can help you get connected to the community to do those focus groups, to gather data, but also to have people work with you in partnership from the start of, even before you're asking for funding, before you even think about your project. What is the problem that we want to tackle together? How should we do it the correct way? Um, and, and really having that input can allow for equitable partnerships, but things like paying people for their participation, giving them um, jobs, helping them uh, hold on to those jobs and sustain those jobs. When you partner with community organizations, give them a part of the grant dollars that are coming with the resources that you're getting. Develop co-learning and capacity, that idea that there are things that your community partners know that you do not. So academics can definitely learn from community members. I feel like this has been a, 
a journey for my own um, professional development and an opportunity to always get ongoing input about what it's like to be a member of this community or the community that you're working with. They can bring in an understanding, and my, my colleague, um, Mr. Rudy Gonzalez, who's going to present after me, can talk about all the ways. And he's a, 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 uh, the executive director for Servicios de la Raza, which is a great resource and a great um, opportunity for us to partner with organizations like his to be able to get a better insight into all of these factors. Okay, we had a, a question about um, promotion and tenure, and that's, it, it's, it's not a trivial issue for many academics, and we're not suggesting that those issues get subsumed. But what I am suggesting is that research alone in your own academic career isn't going to be enough to get and sustain the partnerships that you need. Your work is important to you, but maybe it's the... Dr. Samick questions, so what, in a different way? How is it going to impact the community, and what benefit can the community derive from partnering with you? Um, when I was early in my, process, in, in, in my academic career, we were working um, with diverse communities in California and having a lot of difficulty recruiting populations, and we were not following many of these principles, if any. And I asked a community leader, I said, what, what do we have to do? Why are we having such difficulty in partnering with you? And her response is, well, why should we partner with you? What are we getting out of it? All you want is your publication and your tenure. And I thought, oh, well, actually, she's right. You know, so you have to... You have to really think about, well, it's not, it's not just about me. It's not just about my paper. Maybe, you know, four or five people might cite that paper and maybe ten might download it if I'm, if I'm uh, lucky. It's really about figuring out what you get out of it, what your community partners can get out of it, and all of that would contribute to better outcomes for your clients. You have to focus on local solutions in the general context. So... The idea that you're trying to do something at a national level is hard to get your mind around if you're not addressing things locally. And then encourage systems development through iteration. It's really, some of this work is really tough because you've got very limited funding streams and you have a, a grant, for example, that lasts two years. And when it's over, maybe that partnership dissolves. So you have to think about how are you going to keep it sustained over time. Um, and tolerance for trial and error and endurance are certainly key, and they've been um, something that I've experienced a lot, and many of us do experience, is that you're going to just have to keep moving and keep putting one foot in, f in front of the other. Persistence is key, um, and really, you, you get turned down for one grant, and you try for another. You get turned down for another one, you get a try for another. Um, and then disseminate in various forms for differing audiences. I mean, really, um, I wasn't kidding when I said that maybe 10 people are going to read a paper that I write. Um, that if I'm writing for academic audiences, very few people are going to see that, right? So we have to think about who are, um, who are the people that can disseminate our message. You know, they're community leaders. They're leaders in the social media environment. There's strategies for how to present information that's easy to access, like this kind of um, presentation of data. There's non-traditional ways of sharing information, like through text message or other social media or podcasts. So think about how you're going to disseminate information that's critical for your community. And then realize that community partnerships are long-term. Those grants that we get may be two years, three years. If we're lucky, it's five years. But that is not long in terms of your partnership and your relationship. I think we first started uh, working with Servicios de la Raza in 2002, something like that. Um, so we've been at it for a long time, and we haven't always had funding to sustain that um, to sustain staff or to s sustain um, project opportunities, but we continue to find a way to collaborate, and I would urge you to do the same. Just because your grant runs out doesn't mean that you don't have that responsibility to sustain your partnership. And I think you would find that if your grant runs out and you disappear and you get more grant funding and go back to a community, 
they may resist because they've, they haven't seen you. They might say, well, where have you been? So welcome to commitment. Enjoy your stay. And I hope that you can uh, espouse these principles and share them with all of your uh, partners. Thank you.